Warning, this video contains multiple sequences of flashing lights which may affect viewers who are susceptible to photosensitive epilepsy or other photosensitivities. These sequences will be telegraphed on screen ahead of time and timestamps will be provided if you would like to skip them. Viewer discretion is advised. So Pixar, was it really that hard? Because what took me all of a whopping 20 seconds to say is what you should have done when you first released this goddamn movie in theaters four years ago. But that thought apparently never even crossed your mind, which is irresponsibility of the highest caliber. Oh, sorry, are you confused as to what I'm referring to? Well, you'll see when we get there. For now, let's carry on with the story, shall we? Dever here. This is Elastigirl. I'm in. There's deja vu. Alright, so our beloved family is now on their way to their brand new home that's being loaned to them by their new business partner, Winston Dever. A house they describe as being filled with... Multiple hidden entities. Do be sure to keep that in mind for later, it's going to become very important in due time. Everyone's very impressed by their shiny new home, except for Violet, who snarkily says... Good thing we won't stand out, we don't want to attract any unnecessary attention. You know, I don't seem to recall you being so needlessly rude to people, especially not when what you're actually saying doesn't make any sense at all. This house is clearly far removed from the main city, tucked away in a forest where nobody would ever know you're here, or even that anybody's here at all, because apparently Winston wasn't using this house prior to this point. Presum Presumably for a relatively significant amount of time. Also, one day ago you were complaining about being in the crappy motel asking when you were finally gonna move out of it. Well, now you actually have moved out of it and into just about the most luxurious house you could have ever asked for, in just about the most remote location you ever could have asked for relative to where your school is, and you're still not satisfied? What did you want exactly, a moon base? Oh, whatever, we have bigger fish to fry. Namely, that as Dash runs around discovering all the new features of the house, Violet asks her dad what mom's new job is, to which my immediate thought is, uh, uh, what? D did you guys not tell your kids about what you're doing? Why not? What about her mission to change people's perception of superheroes is something they can't know? We aren't in the first movie anymore. We shouldn't be doing the thing where the parents try to keep secrets from their kids until they ultimately get inadvertently dragged into it and have to work together to save the day. We've moved past that point. And you actually do end up telling the kids what her job is the very next time we see them, so what exactly is the point of hiding it right now? I don't even necessarily think they wouldn't know what you guys are up to anyway, considering the fact that you were in a cheap motel whose sound and likely is not the greatest, so I imagine they probably would have overheard your little midnight chat, but it's fine. So then Dash grabs a nearby remote and starts pushing all the buttons, which is a pretty great summation of his entire role in this movie, both literally and metaphorically, revealing all the cool new features of the house as well as the dumbest features you could ever possibly conceive of, such as retractable floor panels in the living room that the furniture is placed on top of, which, if removed, will cause them all to sink into the water below. Why? Why would you design something like this? Why would there ever be a button to retract the plates directly below the furniture you could potentially be sitting on when using this remote? Or we can try this from the other end. Why would you consciously choose to place the furniture in those positions if you know there are retractable plates beneath them? And why would the remote which controls all the features of the ground floor living room be on the second floor of the house instead of, you know, in the living room where that remote would actually be useful? So Helen tries on her new non-Edna design suit, which she's not too keen about wearing, but you know, new costumes mean new toys to sell, so suck it up. Speaking of toys, she discovers that Evelyn designed her a brand new handy dandy Thinkway Toys approved Elasticycle, which she apparently used to have during her glory days, but never told Lob about. I somehow doubt that because even if it was just something about her past, she never told them while they were dating, or at any point during their decade and a half long marriage. You mean to tell me he never saw her in action in the city with her bike? Really? Not even once. Alright then. And with that, she hops on her bike and sets off into the great unknown, traveling extremely light considering the amount of time she's gonna be away for, and thus begins the adventure to make superheroes legal again. She bikes through the forest and leaps onto the highway, whooping and hollering as she feels that sense of adrenaline that she used to during the glory days end. I like this scene. It's pretty neat. Michael J. Aquino's score certainly helps sell the tone, but the cinematography as we follow Helen on her ride also works really well to help put you in her shoes and feel that same thrilling rush that she gets. Especially considering the level of detail that went into making this motorcycle ride look real. It's not a flawless cruise through the forest. There are all these subtle imperfections in how the bike moves and the slight adjustments that she needs to make to keep it straight with every turn she takes that I really appreciate. Like I said, there are things worth praising in Incredibles 2, and I have no intention of concealing them, for as few and far between as they may be. And this scene is punctuated by her pulling up next to a group of her fans, surprised and excited to see her back in action again. Which is a neat little moment to have, but it also raises another round of world-building questions. The world hates superheroes right now. They're the big bad, because according to Winston, They see what politicians tell them to see. They see destruction, 
and they see you. Which makes you think that this whole thing is an uphill battle and that superheroes have no supporters at all. Now, I already went over why that makes no sense, but that was just by breaking down the logic in isolation. With the wider context, this scene demonstrates to the audience quite clearly that the general public's perception of superheroes is anything but negative. So what does the movie want me to think about the whole ordeal? How are you going to present me a group of people cheering on Elastigirl as she charges triumphantly towards her next big mission minutes after telling me that everybody only sees a destruction and a political spin on whether superheroes are good or bad for society, and that there was apparently nobody willing to come to their defense? I don't have the answer for you, because the film seems to be at odds with itself on what the public opinion of superheroes actually is. Look, I'm not asking for a literal percentage meter to let me know what's up, but some level of consistency would be greatly appreciated. And sadly, you're only going to have more questions on this topic the further into the movie we get. Helen boards the jet that's gonna take her to a city where apparently the crime is big to maximize their chances of making waves in the world of crime fighting, and then we cut back to the rest of the Incredibles who are about to have breakfast. Dash excitedly reaches for the sugar bombs, but alas, Bob takes them away the last second and replaces them with fibros. No sugar bombs on my watch. Making you question why they were even out on the counter in the first place, especially since, again, they just moved here and the house had been empty for quite a while beforehand, so I somehow doubt the previous owner left a bunch of food lying around. And if they were lying around, there's a pretty good chance this stuff has expired anyway, especially that milk carton. That is long gone. Oh yeah, and uh, in case I need to make it clear, this is what we call a nitpick. <laughs> something incredibly minor that has no significant impact on the story as a whole. But it still annoyed me, so into the script it went. Dash asks where Mom is, because apparently Bob still hasn't gotten the kids up to speed on what her new job is, which is incredibly frustrating, but hey, at least Bob finally tells them that she's doing superhero work at her new job. Seems all fine and dandy so far, until Violet starts talking. She questions the situation due to the fact that superheroes are still illegal. Now, in fairness, if I were her and I had been told by my mother at dinner one night that we couldn't be superheroes anymore after that same mother had just told me we could be superheroes and actively encourage us to be superheroes as of a few hours ago, only for her to suddenly leave her family and resume her duties as a superhero the very next day, I would also likely be just a tad sarcastic and even somewhat frustrated by this insanely hypocritical turn of events. So I'll give you a pass on this one, Violet. But the next thing she says does not get her off the hook so easily. Mom is going out illegally to explain why she shouldn't be illegal. Hey. She says this in a very arrogant way, and Bob's lack of a response seems to imply that the writers think she pulled one over on him and trapped him in a game of logic chess, but, uh, she didn't. Yes, she is doing the illegal thing in order to generate proof that said thing is not the harmful act politicians make it out to be to make the case that superheroes are a benefit to society. You can't prove that without actually having recorded evidence of actually saving people as a superhero. Is this a completely unnecessary act, considering all the holes in the situation I discussed previously and the ending of the last movie? Yes, yes. Yes, it is, but still a logical plan nonetheless if we accept this ridiculous set of circumstances. I know you think that Bob's been outsmarted in this little conversation since you show him incapable of thinking of a counter-argument and rapidly ushering everybody to hop onto the bus so they aren't late for school, but Violet hasn't dropped the logic bomb that you think she has, so... Wait a minute, you guys started eating breakfast seconds before the bus rolled up to your house? You cut it that close? Actually, hold on another minute. Why is the bus even stopping here at all when until literally today it was unoccupied and when it was occupied it was the home of... An eccentric billionaire who like to come and go without being seen. I somehow doubt they would have been sending school buses all the way out here just for that guy. Also, buses traveling directly to students' houses is not how these things work. That's why bus stops exist. What's that? You don't think the bus is specifically coming to the house? It's just going to a nearby bus stop? Well, no, that is not the case. We can clearly see it roll up right in front of the Dever house, and there is not a bus stop in sight. Why are you here? <sighs> hey, at least everything with Jack-Jack is fine, right? <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Get it? It's funny because the baby did a poopy in his diaper. Please laugh at this hilarious highbrow comedy. Hey, you want to hear me praise Toy Story 4 for a second? At least it never resorted to any kind of immature toilet humor to try to make the audience laugh. That is a singular point of praise I am willing to give that film. So, uh, enjoy it while it lasts, I suppose. Now we arrive at a scene that made me want to throw something at the screen when I watched this movie for the first time. We discover that as a part of Winston's master plan to record Elastigirl in the act of saving people, he has her sitting in an alley in the worst crime area of the city, listening to a police scanner, waiting for something to happen. There's deja vu. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, dear viewer, Hey, wait a minute. Isn't that the thing that Helen shoot out Bob for doing in the first movie? Why, yes, it is indeed. So how does the movie respond to this? discrepancy? My husband used to listen to a police scanner, waiting for something to happen, and I got mad at him for it. Ugh, I'm such a hypocrite. Hey, film, 
stop it. You cannot just lampshade things like this. To say that you were outright vitriolic towards Bob in the first movie for doing the very same thing you're doing now would be an astronomical understatement. And spoiler alert, this never gets brought up again beyond this point. She doesn't ever talk about it with Bob, or even just joke about it with him in a throwaway line. They just highlight the problem here, and then completely forget about it for the rest of the movie. You can't do that. You can't call out such an obvious contradiction between the movies and then just laugh it off like it's no big deal. Acknowledging the problem does not excuse it. This trick didn't work for Josh Cooley with Toy Story 4, and it sure as hell ain't gonna work here. So Helen hears chatter of a potential threat to the opening ceremony of a hover train and starts driving towards it. Back at the house, it's the evening after school now, and so Violet is getting ready for a date with Tony. Yeah, apparently we've just jumped straight from morning to nighttime, despite it having been a matter of literally less than one minute of the movie's runtime since we last saw the family leave for school. That's something else you're gonna notice as we move throughout this film. Pacing! It is faster than fast and quicker than quick here in Incredibles 2, to the point where you'll blink and suddenly it'll feel like a million things have happened in an unreasonably short amount of time. Oh, and since we're here, I want to draw attention to this hairdryer, which I'm pretty sure only exists in this film so that the animators can flex their muscles and show off the new technology as a contrast to how complicated and frustratingly difficult it was to simulate Violet's hair properly when they were animating the first movie. And man, they really gave her the world's most powerful hairdryer to be able to blow all that hair in a perfectly straight line consistently. But whatever. Bob reads Jack-Jack a bedtime story to put him to sleep and afterwards sits down on the couch to watch TV. But sadly, he can't relax quite yet because Dash does the middle schooler thing where they wait until the absolute last possible minute to ask their parents to help with math homework. I find this scene to be charming as Dash tells his dad that the way he's doing the math is not the way his teachers taught him, thus leading to this line. Why would they change math? Oh, math is math. Okay, math dad. is math. I don't know. I laughed at it. I found this genuinely humorous. The situation of showing your homework to your parents and them trying to help you with it only to quickly discover a radical difference in school teachings between generations was one that I found myself in many, many times as a kid. So I got a good chuckle out of this scene. I will give out points for that. But this also seems like a good time to mention that this is the extent of Dash's contributions to the story of this movie. That's his big story arc, if you could even call it that. He's having trouble with his math homework and needs help, which is, uh... Rather lame, to be blunt. And in case you think we're gonna get a payoff similar to how the football throwing from the first movie was paid off in the climax, I got some real bad news for you on that front. Now, you might say, well, hold on. All these criticisms you've been making about characters other than Helen don't seem entirely fair. Remember, the first movie also put the focus entirely on one character and everyone else was secondary until they started to approach the third act, just like Incredibles 2. To which my response would be, yes. That is true. The A plot was all about Bob, whereas Helen and the kids were relegated to the B plot for most of the movie. But that's because a unified crime-fighting team was what the first film spent its entire runtime building toward. That was the end game of The Incredibles. That was their goal. Every story beat and character moment up until that point was all in service of facilitating this specific shot and setting them up as a crime-fighting family for life. But the same cannot be said for Incredibles 2 because we already underwent all that development to create the team that is The Incredibles. It is not a natural evolution for the story to take that unified team and proceed to consciously and arbitrarily split them apart, giving only one family member anything even remotely resembling significant screen time. Now you might say that, come on, Violet and Dash will eventually get their chance to shine. It's not all about Elastigirl, but that's the thing, we already did this song and dance. They already had the development, we already went through the arc where they grew as siblings and as superheroes who proved themselves to their parents. We shouldn't have have to go through it again. It's quite simple. If you already established this family of superheroes finally being united, then there is no justifiable reason to split them all apart again, especially not if you're going to give most of them such menial tasks as math homework to complete. And so I reiterate, lame. Lame, 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 lame. But hey, maybe, at least, the actual superhero action will be great, right? Well, let's jump back to the last girl and find out for ourselves, shall we? She's currently staking out the opening ceremony of the new hover train, and she does this while standing out in broad daylight without making any attempts to conceal herself, and just about nobody seems to give a crap? Are superheroes illegal or not? Do people hate you or not? Actually, at this moment, whatever the state of superheroes are doesn't matter. Either way, whether you are loved by all or hated by all, you should be getting swarmed by somebody right now. Either fans excited to meet their favorite superhero, police looking to arrest you, or a horde of angry people upset that you destroyed City Hall and Municipal or whatever stupid story they're going with. And in case you think the people in this city wouldn't know what happened with the Underminer because, well, 
well, it happened in a different city, and therefore the news wouldn't have broadcasted or whatever. Clearly, these two cities' news stations have no issues with broadcasting events that take place in each other's locations, as we learn after the upcoming action sequence. But the point is, somebody should have some kind of emotional reaction to your presence at the scene, especially since the police just received a notice minutes ago that there was a threat to potentially disrupting the ceremony. Whether you think she could be the threat or somebody to help you stop the threat, does nobody care enough to stop and talk to her? This is why I have questions about the world building now. The movie tells me via dialogue one state of existence and then shows me through visuals something completely different, and I'm just left totally confused on what you want me to believe is actually going on with public opinion right now. I know the chief of police. There won't be a problem. Oh, really? You know the chief of police in this new city, but you don't know the chief of police back home in Municipalburg well enough to have helped out the Incredibles while they were detained? You mean to tell me that your company has a greater presence in this city than your own hometown? Uh-huh. Whatever you say. With all due respect, if you alone had handled the Underminer, things would have been different. I'm just saying. Whoa, that's a funny joke right there. Truly the peak of comedy. Let's rewind a little bit and take a look at what exactly Elastigirl did during that action scene, shall we? She trampolined Bob into the tunneler to let him do all the work during the fight with the Underminer, then proceeded to disappear from the movie until it was way too late. With the exception of the people on the highway, all the civilians had their lives saved by other members of the family, with Lucius guiding the monorail to safety, Bob in charge of keeping the drill away from the buildings, and the kids keeping the people on the ground out of the line of fire. Furthermore, she was only able to stop the drill in time because she worked together with Bob to overload the boiler and she only survived because Violet was there with her force fields. So to recap, if she alone had handled the Underminer, things would have been different. You nailed that part. Different in that all those people Dash and Violet saved? Dead. People on the monorail? Dead. Herself? Dead. The buildings along the side of the street and City Hall? Flattened and any people inside? Dead. Basically everything about that event would have been categorically worse than the way things actually unfolded if the other heroes weren't on the scene to save people people's lies and minimize destruction. Uh, hello? Are you even paying attention, dude? It was all Mr. Incredible's fault in the first place. If Elastigirl had fought the Underminer by herself instead of Bob, those people in buildings wouldn't have even been in danger in the first place, dude. Nobody can say with absolute certainty how a battle between those two characters would have unfolded and that she 100% would have stopped the Underminer before the tunnel surfaced again. But what I can say is that given how horrendously incompetent Elastigirl has demonstrated to be later in this movie, I think it is very reasonable to say that things may have turned out the exact same way as they did, even if she took on the Underminer all by herself. Especially if he used Robin's attract suit against her, because if it took Mr. Incredible six punches to break out of this thing, then there's no way she ever would have escaped it. And what I can say with 100% certainty is that all these people would have died horribly if she had to deal with this problem entirely by herself. And what a baffling point to even bring up anyway in a movie that is supposed to be all about a family of superheroes working together, but hey, I'm just saying. Moving on, the ribbon is cut and everything's happy for about five seconds, but oh no! The joy ride is brought to a halt as the hover train suddenly pulls an Expedition Everest and sends its passengers rocketing backwards in the opposite direction at dangerously high speeds. So Elastigirl leaps into action and starts chasing after the train. And you know what? I actually really, really like this scene. It's the only action sequence in the entire movie that doesn't fall apart of the scenes when you put it under scrutiny. For starters, they clearly took the time to account for potential ways to more easily resolve the situation. Helen asks Evelyn if there's any way to shut this thing down, if there are overrides or fail-safes in place that they could take advantage of, but nope, they can't shut it down because they've been locked out of the system, and any overrides or fail-safes they have in place would take too much time to utilize. And beyond taking care of the logical baseline for why this scene has to happen at all, the action itself is legitimately mesmerizing to watch. Seeing the creative ways that she uses her elasticity to her advantage in conjunction with her motorcycle is glorious. From things as simple as slingshotting herself over traffic to parkouring across construction equipment to keep up with the train. And the best part about it is that it looks looks rough. Not the animation or anything, obviously that's gorgeous. I mean her actual movement through the city makes it clear that she is flying by the seat of her pants and is just barely able to keep up with the train. Again, it's all about the little imperfections. Bumping into the car as she swerves through traffic. Overshooting her jump and landing on the train. Coming dangerously close to falling off several high platforms as she struggles to keep the bike steady and just generally cutting things extremely close with every split second decision that she makes. Now, is it a flawless scene? No. I do take issue with the fact that as far as navigation is concerned, she possesses a seemingly flawless sense of direction in a city she's never been in before, or at least has never had to navigate this precisely and under this much pressure before, and that her actual motorist skills are still top-notch even after 15 years of inactivity. It's not necessarily an impossibility, it's just a bit of a... 
stretch, you might say, to believe that she's still this proficient even after all these years and in this new location. And in case you think there's a contradiction between me saying she's clearly making many mistakes and barely hanging on, and me saying she's an expert motorist despite her 15-year gap of using a motorcycle, there is an important distinction to make between someone's mastery of a bike's capabilities in regards to the specifics of its handling, acceleration, and traction that makes it tick, and someone's ability to come up with ways to use those motorist skills in the heat of the moment to figure out a way to stop the train. But beyond that, it's a fantastic watch. Once again, Michael Giacchino steals the show with his music, but even if we divorce the scene from the score, they make use of everything we know Elastigirl can do as she fights to keep up the pace and stop the train before it's too late, and expand upon those abilities to keep the action fresh and exciting. Every second of this chase makes use of her powers in a creative and inventive way, and for as much as some of this is a bit of a reach in regards to her mastery of the geography, like I said, and even the idea that one Helen shoot would be enough to stop the momentum of this train, even taking into consideration the additional friction being generated is a bit out there. I can't honestly analyze this movie without taking the time to praise this beautiful scene. It almost feels out of place. When surrounded by the piles of rampant nonsense that are the other scenes in this movie, it's really refreshing to be able to relax and enjoy a well-made, engaging action scene. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about that one there, Chief. I was already teetering on whether or not the front end of this train would have been able to be stopped as efficiently as it was, but this? Yeah, I feel like that should have been enough to send the train over the edge. Again, not necessarily strictly impossible, but very, very lucky that the other half of the train didn't knock it any further off than this. And thus concludes the Elastigirl Hover Train Chase. Hopefully you enjoyed my praise of this sequence, by the way, because this is the absolute peak of the movie's quality, both in terms of action and character conflict, with maybe one exception, it's all downhill from here. Helen enters the train and checks to make sure nobody was injured, then angrily storms into the front, demanding an explanation from the local pilots. It is immediately apparent to the audience, both based on her earlier attempts to get his attention where he was completely brain dead, and his sudden snap back into consciousness here, abruptly asking, What happened? that he was under some sort of mind control. And to further add to the mystery, an ominous text message pops up onto the display saying, Welcome back, Elastigirl. Signed, The Screen Slaver. Ah, yes. The Screen Slaver. The infamous villain of Incredibles 2 and such a massive can of worms to open in terms of how utterly broken they are. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We got a long road ahead of us before we'll have to talk about The Screen Slaver. So for now, let's jump back over to Bob and the kids. Bob Bob's finally gotten Jack-Jack to sleep again after he woke up earlier and all seems well at last until he discovers that Violet is home now because Tony stood her up on her date and now she's feeling the big sad. He tries to comfort her but she tells him to buzz off and so gives up and redirects his attention to Jack-Jack. Again, Bob really doesn't stop to think or even a second, that there might be a bit of a connection between Dicker's mind-erasing tendencies and Tony's standing up vile on their date. It's not like Dicker keeps his actions hidden from the family. He was quite blunt about it in the first movie. We gotta pay to keep the company quiet. We gotta pay damages. Erase memories. Relocate your family. Every time it gets harder. Bob knows exactly what Dicker is capable of, and yesterday he told him that Tony saw Violet in her superhero costume without her mask on, and he seriously can't connect the dots here? You know, I don't seem to recall you being this dense in the first movie. In fact, I actually think you were quite intelligent back then. You had an impeccable sense of situational awareness, efficient problem-solving skills, and were quite adept at outsmarting your opponents. But now you can't put two and two together when it comes to Tony's mind erasure? Alrighty then. Another significant blow to Mr. Incredible's intelligence. You love to see it. So now we arrive at the... the... The, the raccoon fight. You know, the scene that everybody was losing their minds over when the film first came out, saying, Oh my god, the raccoon fight was so funny. Jack-Jack absolutely stole the show, dude. Which is what, like the third time that I've heard the sentiment about the cute, funny, small character that can be exploited for easy comedy? This whole scene is emblematic of a prioritization of lazy, childish humor over even moderately cleverly written jokes. Why bother putting effort into comedy when you can just show a cute little baby doing cute little baby things? You know, like beating the shit out of raccoons. Just for fun! Jack-Jack sees a raccoon rummaging through their garbage and so logically decides to murder him for seemingly no reason at all. I'm not kidding. He looks at him and then suddenly gets a strong motivation to kill because the robber on the TV said, No! And so Jack-Jack faces himself outside before proceeding to beat the ever-living crap out of this poor raccoon. <laughs> 
Alright, let's unroll the laundry list of problems with this disaster of a scene. To begin with, how is Jack-Jack not being ripped to shreds? He doesn't immediately use his superpowers against the raccoon. It starts off as just a one-on-one -on -one test of combat. Are you aware of how vicious raccoons are? This thing would have ripped Jack-Jack to pieces. It would not be getting memed on by a tiny baby. Why does he even hate this random raccoon at all? What, because he's rummaging through their trash? He's just a desperate guy trying to feed his family and suddenly this infant human is mercilessly ripping him apart. How does Jack-Jack even have a presence of mind to understand what a trash can is? He's still a non-verbal infant and we aren't in the Rugrats world where babies can actually think intelligently. Not that Rugrats. But also, even if he did know what the raccoon was doing, why would he care? It's just their trash can, they're not gonna eat anything out of it anytime soon. How does it affect his life if RJ steals their food? Actually, wait a minute, why is there even a raccoon here at all? Didn't you people just move into this house like Today? How have you already accumulated enough food to warrant a trash can this full? Jesus, it, it's actually just Toy Story 4 all over again. The same thing happened in the kindergarten classroom where despite class having been out all summer long, this bin was already full enough to have a spork in it from some kid's lunchbox. The only reason this scene seems to exist is to remind you that he has powers, which... Yeah, we already knew that. This wasn't news to us. You didn't need to throw a raccoon at Jack-Jack and make him beat him up to remind the audience of that. But then again, this scene doesn't just remind you of powers that Jack-Jack used to have. It introduces a whole plethora of new ones. Some of them we already knew about, of course, such as his ability to shapeshift and spontaneously self-combust. But some of them are brand spanking new, such as... The ability to face through solid objects, telekinesis, super strength, the color of his laser eyes has changed from blue to green for some reason, he can turn himself into jelly, he can clone himself, and apparently he can also electrify himself. And all I have to say about that is... Stop! Everybody stop! Guys, you can't give Jack-Jack this many goddamn abilities. You just can't, Nemo. You can't create a character who is, perhaps aptly named, a jack-of-all-trades. But instead of being a master of none, he appears to be a master of all. Jack-Jack's use of his powers at the end of the first movie was sporadic and panic-driven. He was a tiny little baby, and all he knew about the situation was that he was being taken very high up and very far away from his parents by an extremely intimidating man he didn't recognize. Nothing about his usage of powers here is even remotely deliberate. He's frantically trying to channel any instinctive ability he possibly can to fight off his attacker to save himself. But this crap? These are the actions of a cold and calculating monster on the hunt, demonstrating an absolutely baffling mastery of power as well as hand-to-paw combat. And this isn't even the full extent of Jack-Jack's abilities. He's going to be given even more OP superpowers later on. I do not know what in the world you were thinking with these decisions. Every new power you give him because you think it's a funny little joke is another thing to make him even more overpowered. There's a reason why the team of Incredibles works as well as it does. They're all incredible powerful individually, but they have their weaknesses. They can't do everything, which is why they need to work together in order to battle the enemies they face to cover for everybody's faults. But there is literally no reason for Jack-Jack to ever need a teammate given how much we can see him do in this scene. This entire battle only serves to create more problems in terms of impossible scenarios, character damage to the goddamn baby, which I didn't even think was possible, raising even more world-building questions in regards to the limit to superhero powers, and significantly altering the stakes for all subsequent battles he takes place in one way or another. Oh, and in case you want to say something like, Oh, come on, can't you just turn your brain off and enjoy the action scene for what it is? No, no I can't, because stuff like this happens. <laughs> So he's dead. Very, very dead. A baby with super strength just threw an inflamed poolside ottoman thing directly at this tiny raccoon with maximum force. You absolutely did not survive. You are dead. Oh no, he's fine. There he is. What? How is this possible? You should be dead! How did you even get untangled from the chair and wind up over there? Did you pull an underminer and also summon the power of Toy Story 4? Also, you mean to tell me this raccoon is smart enough to understand enough about how fire works to make the conscious choice to knock over the grill so it's ashes will extinguish Jack-Jack? Like, just no. Absolutely not. I do not believe you when you tell me that. This isn't a world like Over the Hedge where RJ is anthropomorphized and demonstrated as possessing an understanding of the human world. This is clearly just a random raccoon doing its thing going trash can diving. Look, if you found this scene funny, that's great. I'm happy to hear it got a laugh out of you. But this is complete and utter nonsense from start to finish and only seeks to pose more problems across the story. But believe it or not, things only get worse when Bob wakes up from all the commotion and races to break up the fight because Bob is pleasantly surprised to find out that Jack-Jack has superpowers? I 
I did how? How could this have possibly been a surprise to you? I get that you didn't know what was going on when Jack Jack first showed off his powers because he was way too far away for you to clearly see, and by the time Helen grabbed him, he had already transformed back to normal. That's fair enough. But I'd like to remind you all of the Jack Jack attack short where we saw that Digger erased Kari's memory specifically because she had seen that the baby had superpowers. So if you mean to tell me in this scene that the family didn't know about Jack Jack, then how could Digger have possibly known? I had always assumed when I watched that short that they must have figured out Jack Jack had superpowers because Helen heard Kari saying that weird things were happening with Jack Jack on the phone, and that there'd be no other logical justification for how Digger could possibly understand Jack Jack's superpowers without the family knowing. You'd think that after hearing that phone call and after arriving home to see the place in complete and utter disarray, and just using basic common sense based on how your other children turned out, you logically come to the conclusion that maybe your baby has superpowers. Just, just maybe. I don't know for sure. Is that not why you gave Jack Jack a mask and his super suit at the end of the last movie? <sighs> I don't even know anymore. Next up, Helen calls home and prepare to want to die again, because every time these two have spoken in this movie so far, I felt the inexplicable urge to put on a cape and find the nearest airplane. But hey, maybe this one will be different. No. After warm greetings, Bob opens up a sentence by saying, Jack-Jack, I want to emphasize that clearly. The only words to leave his mouth are, Jack-Jack. That is all he needs to say to send Helen into a neurotic panic attack, and immediately assume that something has gone horribly, horribly wrong, and he got into some terrible accident. Got an accident. I knew it. I'm coming home right now. I no, never should. No, no, no. Accident. She never got to finish that sentence, but it's pretty clear she was going to say, I knew I never should have left, or I knew I never should have taken this job, or something along those lines. Her immediate gut assumption is that Bob is incompetent and incapable of parenting the kids by himself. Which he is, make no mistake, he very clearly is incompetent in this movie based on what's happened thus far and based on events that we will see unfold soon enough, but her lack of faith in that possibility is pathetic. She tries to backpedal by saying she misspoke, but I don't buy it. She spoke from her gut and on instinct. Those were her True blue, unfiltered feelings coming through, and I'm sorry, but given everything they've been through together, the idea that she has this little faith in Bob's capabilities is actually insulting to me. But the pain train ain't over yet, because after Bob lies to her and says that everybody's fine and dandy when they are anything but across the board, she yells at the top of her lungs that she managed to save a runaway train with no casualties! <laughs> And this is just too much stupid for me to take in all at once. First of all, upon hearing that Helen managed to save hundreds of people during this train chase without a single casualty, his response isn't, Oh my god, that's amazing, honey! Superheroes will be legal again in no time! I'm so proud of you, and I know the kids are gonna be so excited to hear you tell the story when you get home, which is what he should say, given everything we know about his character. But no, instead, because remember, Bob sucks now, he's actively distraught about this turn of events. He goes from stunned, to disappointed, to sad, to legitimately angry. Angry. Sunken down into the couch as his wife screams with joy and definitely makes all her hotel neighbors love her very, very much. Who is this character? What have you done with the original Mr. Incredible? The one who grew to understand his missteps as a father and commit to prioritizing his family above all else, and who finally evolved past his immature desire to always be number one no matter what? Where did he go? Did you swap him out with a different Bob when I wasn't looking? Because you're never going to convince me that these two people are at all the same. Second of all, Helen. Your actions are completely contradictory to how committed you were to your family in the first movie. That was the core of your character, to the point where even under enormous pressure given the stakes at hand, you still made sure to keep your kids calm and collected, and offer emotional support when they needed it most. But during this phone call, your only concern is to ride your nostalgia high and jack yourself up over how great you are in action today. You don't even once stop to ask to talk to the kids, or at the very least consider calling during a time of day when they would have been actually awake to talk to you. The only time you have even the slightest interaction with them during this little road trip of yours is when Dash interrupted you mid-mission. And considering how little self-awareness you seem to have in regards to the fact that the adrenaline rush you're getting right now is the very same thing Bob was chasing in the last movie and you chastised him for it, I'm left wondering why I should like you at all. Either of you, for that matter. You've both become horrifically unlikable. For very different reasons, but still unlikable all the same. Finally, and most importantly, Elastigirl is being praised to high heaven for her heroic actions today on, like, ten different news stations when literally yesterday the incredible Incredible saved City Hall, and an entire highway, and monorail full of people, and were shunned for it. So please, movie, I beg of you, explain to me what the difference is between these two events. What is the distinction between the Underminer and the Hover Train? Why is she being praised for doing the very same thing the family did at the beginning of this movie and were shunned for? How has everybody had such a massive heel turn this quickly? If superheroes are illegal, why has no one come to arrest her yet? And if people are this willing to praise superheroes when they do good things, then where 
were they for this debacle? Where are the politicians that are supposed to be putting a spin on this? You have to give me more than this movie, because as it stands, you presented two different life or death situations to me, both of which resulted in hundreds of lives saved, and only one of which has actually resulted in the heroes being appropriately rewarded for their actions. And if you want a more direct comparison, what's the difference between the train accident from the first movie, which served as one of the main inciting incidents that got superheroes forced underground, and this train accident? Is it the fact that the people on board that train were critically injured, but nobody on board this train was killed? Because in that case, I guess it's finally time to call that little statistic into question. Given the force with which the two halves of the train bumped into each other, and even just how abruptly it started speeding in the other direction, I do not believe that nobody was injured. I am willing to believe that nobody was killed, but no injuries? Nah, there's no way. In fairness, the news never explicitly says there were no injuries, but when Helen is running through the train, she asks, Is everybody alright? Is anybody injured? Are you alright? And nobody speaks up, so I'm pretty sure they want you to think that Helen had a completely flawless run with this train incident, and nobody was even remotely hurt in any significant way, which I just straight up do not believe. There are so many things about this situation that don't make any sense at all. The contradictions between all these events, on top of the horrifically disrespectful portrayal of these characters, culminate in me simply refusing to believe that any of this could have ever possibly happened, and makes me want to retroactively retract my praise for the train scene, because for as phenomenal as it is to watch happen in real time, the way it plays into the rest of the story as a whole is utterly nonsensical. But hey, at least the scene ends on a wholesome note. Bob and Helen sign off with fond farewells, and then Bob carries Jack-Jack and Dash up the stairs and puts them both to bed. It's simple, but it's a touching way to cap off this scene, especially after the garbage we just had to listen to. And that mood actually persists into the next scene as Bob, dissatisfied with how the day's events unfolded, stays up all night to try to understand Dash's math homework and teaches it to him the next morning with a charming remix of the main Incredibles theme playing in the background that fits the scene perfectly. Sorry, have I been talking about the music too much? What can I say? Michael Giacchino is a musical legend, and hearing how amazing his scores are just gives me even more contempt for this waste of a film. Point is, I like this scene. It's short, but it's got some heart behind it. And while it doesn't exactly make up for this... It did at least brighten my spirits a little bit when watching the movie for the first time, and I was hopeful that, maybe, if we kept up with some scenes like this, we could still manage to hold on to even just a tiny smidge of the characters' personalities by the end. Then reskinned Tony pops back into the movie and everything breaks again. <laughs> Oh, hi, how are you? Hey, Violet, what if you tried being slightly less of a creep? What if you did that? Also, wait a minute, you're in school right now? You- What? When was your date with this blockhead supposed to be again? So, Friday? Friday. Friday. Hey, do you guys know what comes after Friday? Saturday! As in, the weekend, where the kids do not have to go to school. What are they doing here right now? Oh, and in case you want to say, maybe this isn't the next day. Maybe they just skipped the entire weekend, during which apparently absolutely nothing interesting happened at all. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that that excuse isn't going to work, because the whole reason Bob stayed up so late was because he wanted to help Dash understand his math homework before his test. We still have some time to finish it before you test. Which, presumably, would have been the next school day, otherwise it wouldn't really have been much of a rush. Then, Dash wakes up early the next morning, and during breakfast they go over the math homework, and then upon checking the clock to confirm it's about time to get ready for school, Bob puts the textbook in Dash's backpack, and we immediately cut to the middle of the school day. So they definitely did not skip the weekend and jump to Monday. They just forgot how weeks work. Anyway, Violet's a creep. Hi. She tells Tony that she's at a new house now, assuming that must have been the reason why he didn't show up to the date, reminding him that she... Did write my address on your locker in permanent ink. Wow! With permanent ink, too! Which is, uh, weird. Yep, it's weird. Sorry, but Violet's crush on Tony wasn't this creepy in the first movie. It was cute. It was sort of like an aw, how adorable thing to watch, even if Tony got literally zero development, and is indistinguishable from a wet tissue. You could at least feel happy for Violet with how she had grown throughout the movie. But the way she acts when it comes to Tony this time around is borderline obsessive. They've turned her infatuation with him from a cute little crush to I am literally going to center my entire personality around you and may God have mercy on your soul if things don't work out between us. And as such, we watch peak cringe unfold on screen as Violet tries to explain why she was dressed up in a weird costume, but it's all in vain as Tony ultimately just asks, uh, do, do I know you? And so Violet gives up and storms off angrily, and then we come back to Helen who's getting ready to go on stage for a news broadcast as Elastigirl, but before the cameras start rolling, she bumps into an ambassador who is very thrilled to be able to meet her. Please remember her, she will become important again in about five seconds, and you're gonna need to be really invested in her survival after having just met her, so uh, do keep her in mind, please. They then go live on Twitch, and anchorman Chad says that, Well, all the polls are going in your direction. And I just have so many questions. Where were these polls when you stopped the Omnidroid? How was a runaway train being saved more capable of 
of getting you all to support the idea of superheroes being made legal again, then saving the entire city from destruction at the hands of this massive robot? Ah, but all those questions will soon be forgotten as the broadcast is suddenly hijacked by the screen slaver once again, and Helen immediately recognizes that the screen is the thing that's controlling him, which I'm willing to accept considering that the name of the villain she just crossed paths with was literally Screen Slaver, and considering that Chad is looking directly at this screen and the flashing, seizure-inducing imagery certainly looks hypnotic, what I'm not willing to accept is that apparently Helen doesn't fall victim to the same spell as everyone else despite her eyes directly looking towards the screen before her hand goes up in front of her face. I'm also not willing to accept the idea that Helen doesn't immediately try to move the screen out of the way, or move Chad out of the way, or hell, just break all the damn screens like we're going to see her do in a few moments anyway. Why wasn't that your first course of action as soon as Chad was hypnotized? Why are you bothering trying to slap him awake instead of just dragging his ass out of the chair? Oh, but she doesn't have time to worry about the broadcast anymore because the screen slaver has a very, very subtle line of dialogue that gets communicated through Chad. I could hijack the ambassador's arrow cage while it's still airborne. Right, Elastigirl? Wow, you guys didn't even try with that, did you? But alas, it is time for another action sequence, one that is just as masterfully animated and scored as the motorcycle chase. It's mesmerizing to watch unfold, but my god, there are a lot of problems to unpack here. Elastigirl breaks into one of the three helicopters, but sadly guesses wrong as the ambassador is not inside this one, and she's also quickly able to identify the other wrong chopper as the one to the left immediately flies towards her and the helicopter blade slices through the window and nearly beheads all of them. Wow! It it sure is a good thing it only destroyed the window and didn't just straight up crash into you and blow everybody up in the process. They very easily could have died there had the pilot of that other helicopter missed by even an inch. And, by the way, it's important to keep in mind that the other pilot can't actually see where they're flying to. Their eyes are entirely fixated on the screen in front of them and so they can't actually look around at what's going on. And we learn later that all of their actions are done via commands from the screen slaver themselves. So how exactly could they have pulled off a move this precise without actually being in the cockpit? Well, the real answer is that there's obviously no way in hell that ever could have happened. In fact, the movie is kind of hoping you're going to forget this scene happens later because this whole thing falls apart under the rules the screen slaver establishes. Elastigirl swings herself onto the ambassador's helicopter and tries to get in through the window, but then a bullet comes flying through the glass. Damn, man. It sure is a good thing you weren't one inch closer when that gun went off or else you'd be dead. I also like that the ambassador waited until after the guard had fired the shot to tell him it was Elastigirl because it would have been even more awkward if that shot had actually hit her. I also like like that apparently the bodyguard isn't capable of recognizing Elastigirl, the superhero that dominated every news station in existence last night? Shouldn't you be slightly better at accurately assessing threats considering the fact that you're a bodyguard for the ambassador? She then grabs the bodyguard's gun and uses it to break into the cockpit and smash all the screens, then quickly ushers them out of their seats, takes control of the chopper, and pulls up at the absolute last possible second before the other helicopter crashes into them and kills everybody. Meaning had she been literally half a second slower, everybody would have been dead. Meaning that the screen slaver clearly isn't above killing Elastigirl, because this is now the second crazy stunt they've pulled that very easily could have, and honestly probably should have, gotten her killed. Something else I hope you keep in mind for the end of this movie. And again, how can they have this much precise control over the helicopters to be able to pull off moves like this when they literally cannot see where they're flying? Then she kicks all the bodyguards into the river below and tries to lose the other helicopter, but fails as the engine catches fire, and so she slingshots herself and the ambassador out of the chopper as it... <laughs> Wow! Boy, howdy, Elastigirl sure is great at not causing collateral damage, and let me tell you, those pie charts really were onto something. <sighs> I really wish this scene didn't make zero sense so I could actually enjoy it, because the cinematography combined with the music is legitimately spine-chilling at times. Unironically, among the most masterfully directed action sequences in any animated movie I've ever seen. Back with the rest of the family, it's the next morning now, and Violet angrily storms downstairs, saying, Boys are jerks and superheroes suck. Hey, quick question. Why did you wait this long to talk about this. You guys did the same thing earlier with the chat between Bob and Helen after the meeting with the Devers. You present a situation that warrants a conversation, skip ahead an absurd amount of time, and then finally allow the characters to actually have that conversation. She really never brought this up after school yesterday. No. She laments that Tony's pretending that he doesn't even know her while Bob reassures her that it's best for him to forget about her if he did see her in her super suit. Jovially going into a story about how Dicker has erased so many minds over the years whenever someone figured out his secret identity and he still doesn't connect the dots. You 
inspired lemon. You are fully aware of the fact that Dicker erases people's minds whenever they catch on to the truth about your secret identities. You then proceeded to tell Dicker that Tony figured out your daughter's secret identity. What the hell did you think was going to happen? Did you think he was going to take him out for a nice picnic and politely ask him not to tell anyone what happened? No, of course not, you idiot. He was going to erase his memory. Like, actually, what did you expect him to do outside of that? Unless you mean to tell me that he did know he was going to erase Tony's memory, but forgot to specify that he didn't want to erase all of his memory so he could still remember Violet and the movie date that they had. In which case, A, you should have been much more explicit with your instructions when you knew how important this was to her, and B, if you thought there was even a chance of Tony forgetting her, don't you think it would have been a good idea to at least warn Violet in case something like this happened? This whole subplot is so monumentally stupid. Why did you people have to erase Tony's memory? Why couldn't you have let the two of them actually go on their date and have Violet wrestle with the responsibilities of balancing a superhero's life and the personal desires of a teenager? I know that's not exactly the most original concept in the world, but it didn't make a hell of a lot more sense as a conflict than having Bob act like a moron the whole time to justify erasing Violet's big payoff from the first movie. Anyway, after Bob tells this story, Violet figures out that it was Dicker that erased Tony's memory because obviously anybody with a collective two brain cells would have been able to figure out this was going to happen the second you got Dicker involved in the first place. So now she's gone from the big sad to the big mad because... You told them about Tony! Well, duh. You consciously made the choice to tell Bob about Tony, so obviously you expected him to do something about it. Did he not let you know in advance he would talk to Dicker? He didn't have a reassuring line of, Don't worry, honey, I'll talk to Dicker and we'll get this sorted out. Nothing? I guess not. Then Violet storms upstairs and to really make sure we keep the tone of this very dramatic scene consistent, we decided to have Jack-Jack slam the cereal bowl into his face. <laughs> Laugh at the cute funny baby, please. While Bob starts picking up the copyright-free Cheerios that have fallen onto the floor, Violet returns downstairs with her superhero costume in hand and says that she hates superheroes and renounces them, proceeding to attempt to destroy her costume in the garbage disposal. And to the audience, this is a funny little visual gag because we know from the first one that these suits are virtually indestructible. So there was never any actual tension in her potentially destroying her super suit. But she clearly didn't know that, otherwise she never would have tried this little stunt. Meaning that she was literally willing to throw away her superhero lifestyle, all because she thinks being seen in this suit cost her a date with a boy. I just thought it was kind of cool. What was? Fighting crime. As a family. A few inches later. I hate superheroes, and I renounce them! Which, uh... Thematically speaking, Violet prioritizing her love life over her family's superhero endeavors seems to be a bit at odds with the rest of this movie. And character-wise, I'm willing to go so far as to say that it's an outright contradiction to Violet's arc from the first film about discovering her own self-worth. When she finally gets the date with Tony she was hoping for at the beginning, she isn't an emotional wreck about it. She's very cool, calm, collected, and nonchalant about it. Violet demonstrates a remarkable amount of emotional maturity for someone her age. Yet now, she centered her entire self-worth around him, and I actually hate that. Violet's entire story arc throughout this movie is driven 100% by Tony to the point where she goes completely fucking insane in this scene once she realizes that she's been erased from his memory. <laughs> Which, again, doesn't seem to sync up real well with the way the rest of this movie is written. But also, why exactly is this even a problem at all? It's not like they had been dating for years and they lost all the development together. He asked her out on a date like three days ago. And to my knowledge, that was the only interaction, or at least the only meaningful interaction, that you two ever had together. So I feel like if you just walked up to him tomorrow and asked him out, he'd probably say yes, and then you could just resume normally as if nothing had ever happened in the first place. You haven't lost any significant progress in your relationship with him. In fact, you actually do exactly what I just suggested at the end of this movie, so I don't understand what the problem is here. Is she having adolescence? <laughs> funny. Moving on. Helen is being escorted to the Devers' office for a meeting, but en route she sees a massive horde of people outside her car, chanting in support of her, and, by extension, superheroes as a whole being made legal again. Literally three days ago, we were told that everybody hated superheroes universally and no one was around to support them, but throughout those three whole days, Elastigirl's few actions have apparently been enough to warrant this kind of a support group. This is what I mean about this movie moving too goddamn fast. It should be taking weeks, maybe even months, for this significant of a cultural shift around superheroes to occur. But this is all happening in a matter 
matter of days. It's absurd. Whatever, Elastigirl walks into Winston's office who tells her that the ambassador made a big speech about Elastigirl today. Turns out saving someone's life makes a good impression on them. Who knew, huh? Uh, me? I knew that, and I imagine most people knew that. Thus begging the question of why the countless people whose lives they saved in the beginning of the movie, potentially including government officials inside City Hall, weren't around to say anything in support of them. Elastigirl expresses her concern that the screen slaver is still out there because I guess the little girl's sign really got under her skin. And Winston's response to those concerns is, hey, What do you want in your tombstone? She worried a lot? Hey, Mr. Payne, the screenslaver almost killed three helicopters full of people, including the ambassador, as well as a hover train carrying hundreds of passengers. They are a very credible threat that seems to be specifically targeting a last girl that you guys need to account for. This isn't something you should just brush off as, oh, come on, you're overthinking things. Did you drop this line into the script to try to throw us off the scent so you could try to make your big twist villain reveal as shocking as possible? Because it's not gonna work. You literally named one of your characters Evil Endeavor. In an attempt to lift her spirits, I guess, Winston leads Lost Girl into a room filled with rookie superheroes that he flew in from all around the world who were inspired to come out of hiding following her heroic actions over the past few days, and so- I'm sorry, is that a fucking owl? All of them get approximately one line of expository dialogue in this scene, with the exception of this girl, with the very brightly colored costume to make sure she stands out from the other people in the room, who gets the frame all to herself and a whole paragraph's worth of introduction. Gee, I wonder which of these characters is gonna have actual relevance to the plot. She awkwardly introduces herself as Void, and then shows off her superpower, which is that she can... Oh, oh, no, 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 guys, no, bad idea, bad idea, you can't do that. You don't realize what you've just done. You cannot give one of your characters the ability to use portals with such ease. You're going to break your entire story in half if you do that. And before you say, oh, well, what about Doctor Strange? He can make portals wherever he wants. I'm sensing hypocrisy. Yeah, guess what? I don't like that either. In fact, I actually hate it. His ability to use portals breaks things in the MCU as well, in every movie he's in. There are countless situations from the original Doctor Strange through both Avengers movies he partakes in, to No Way Home and all the way up to Multiverse of Madness, where portals could have been used in ways that were previously established that simply aren't, and had they been used, things would have ended very differently. And the same thing is going to happen here. Void is going to be absolutely critical to the climax of Incredibles 2. It cannot function without her, and everything about the way in which she is utilized makes absolutely no sense. But then, I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself again. By the way, how is exactly did Winston find out about these guys and fly them in when their identities were secret and they've been in hiding? The only reason he was able to track down Bob and Helen is because he just so happened to bump into Frozone downtown. He didn't go looking for them, it just happened by pure chance. So how in the world did you find these guys? Whatever. So now we get the exposition speed run where all the other superheroes bluntly explain their superpowers in one or two lines of dialogue to make sure you understand what they all do without even a trace of show don't tell. We get to see Crusher crush a can, and Winston gets a static electricity shock, but everybody else just tells us what they can do. And we're lucky even get that much for some characters. It's just textbook bad writing. One of the earliest lessons you learn is show, don't tell. The first one never had to say, hi, I'm Mr. Incredible, and I'm a strong boy. They just showed you what he, along with all the other superheroes, including the kids, were capable of, and they did so in very creative and engaging ways throughout the first act. This is just an animated PowerPoint presentation of character exposition. Once the slideshow concludes, Winston says goodnight and leaves Helen and Evil Endeavor to chat amongst themselves. And after a brief bit about how Helen is finally in the spotlight and no longer overshadowed by Mr. Incredible, we get the conversation everybody always references when talking about the themes of Incredibles 2, where these two characters discuss inventors versus sellers and which of them has the greater influence. And I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty neat. In isolation, but in the wider context of the story, it has no relevance to literally anything. I've seen so many people praise the mature messaging of this movie, always specifically highlighting this scene as the primary example, saying that it's written for the adults and doesn't treat the audience like idiots with how they tackle subjects like these. And technically speaking, that's correct. If you actually listen to the dialogue between these two characters, you will find yourself receiving an intelligent conversation between two people about the importance of inventors and salespeople and the working relationship that they have with each other. Mostly. If I discovered the origin of the universe, my brother would find a way to market it as a f uh, foot massager. <laughs> 
truly comedy goals, but it's only meaningful in a vat with no connection to anything. The messaging behind this conversation doesn't have any thematic relevance to the rest of the story. You could cut it out of the film and lose absolutely nothing, except an incredibly ham-fisted, sloppy segue into the next big plan for fighting the screenslaver, but that's a plot point that could be accomplished a million other ways, thematically and conceptually. It feels so out of place with the rest of the plot that I'm convinced it was written specifically to trick people into thinking the movie was deep when in reality it was just a meaningless rant. It's not like Toy Story 4 where the ideas that it presents are contradicted by the events that unfold. There's just actually no correlation at all between this conversation and the story of Incredibles 2. And yeah, like I mentioned, they embarrassingly attempt to segue from this chat into the next big action sequence where Helen's new plan is to try to bait the screen slaver into activating again and then lock onto the signal of the broadcast and trace it to its origin where she will hopefully find their headquarters. Can't wait to see how that unfolds a bit later, but for now, we're heading back over to a lover's quarrel where Bob calls Dicker about erasing Violet from Tony's memory and- Wait a minute, what is all this stuff doing here? Didn't your house get- was it only your normal clothes that were destroyed, but literally everything else, including your super suits, were just fine? How did you-, you but that- I Bob calls to let him know that when he activated the amnesionator, he accidentally erased Violet entirely. How does Dicker respond? Oops. Wow. Fantastic. Absolutely stellar stuff. Do you not care at all about the fact that you potentially just created a massive social problem for Violet? Yeah, I know I talked earlier about how it's really no big deal that he forgot her, but he doesn't know that. For all he knows, these two have been dating for years. Can you at least pretend to give a damn about these guys? What happened to your pleasant words and farewell from the motel parking lot? Where did that dicker go? You've been off the job for three days and all of a sudden you stopped caring about the family you just got finished helping? What is it with three days and people having radical changes in character? Ah, but fear not everybody. For dicker informs Bob that Tony works at his parents' restaurant called The Happy Platter, and so he decides that he's going to take the family there for a nice dinner in the hopes that they'll get Tony as a waiter and then Violet can- Whoa, whoa, no, 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 stop, stop everything, hold it right there, this is literally the worst idea anybody has ever had in history of ideas. You're about to completely sandbag your daughter by placing her into a situation she most likely would rather jump into a pit full of hyenas to avoid than she would actively come here if given the choice. And you aren't only going to think that this is actually the biggest big brand plan in the world, you're going to maintain an aura of infuriating confidence as the world comes crashing down all around you. Anybody with half a brain would have looked at this idea and said, no! And if you're going to entertain this idea for even a second and not shut it down immediately, can you at least talk to Violet first to see if this was something she even wanted to try at all? You aren't doing this for your own amusement, theoretically. You're doing this with the express purpose of helping her try to fix her relationship with Tony, which, again, doesn't even need fixing because they never had a relationship to begin with. This is all point Pointless. But if for whatever reason you think that this plan is going to help, you can't just drop it on her out of the blue. You have to take the time to discuss it with her first, or at the very least warn her before they get to the restaurant by saying, Hey honey, that boy you like works at this restaurant, you might get him as a waiter. No need to be worried though, Mr. Incredible's got everything under control. But also, shouldn't Violet be suspicious of this anyway? Does she not know that the Happy Platter is his family's restaurant? Is that somehow not common knowledge? Nobody at their school has ever eaten there before? It's not like this is some random slushy dog restaurant he works at just because he has to. This is a restaurant with his family's name attached to it. They own the place. I do not believe for a second, especially considering that Violet had a crush on this guy for what I think we can reasonably assume to be a significant amount of time, and therefore presumably would have known a decent amount about him, that she wouldn't immediately recognize where they are and want to run the hell away as fast as possible. Instead, she just sounds completely disinterested and snarky about their dinner, and I once again find myself asking why they've made you into such a little prick in this movie. Oh, and by the way, how lucky is it not only that Tony was actually working today, but also that they were sat at one of his tables, and that one of his tables was even available in the first place? Now you might say, ah, don't you see? Bob made sure they got sat with Tony because he said, we'd like a booth over there. Except that's silly, because literally how does he have an intricate understanding of which waiters are responsible for which tables at a restaurant he only found out existed a matter of a few hours ago? And why would he not have just said, can we sit with Tony? That's what I do, and what any reasonable human being does when they know one of the waiters really well and want to be sat with them. You might say that he does that so he can conceal a surprise from Violet. After all, his justification for dragging him all the way out here to this restaurant is clearly a lie. I thought Vi would want to change a pace from drive-in food. I like drive-in food. Which, first of all, I don't buy that for a second considering your attitude towards the motel earlier, but let's put that aside for now. If that is his reasoning, then that is just another ding <coughs> against his character because if he was even slightly competent, he would understand how terrible of an idea this is and how doubly terrible of an idea it is to surprise her with Tony being her waiter. Anyway, everything goes horribly wrong as anybody with half a brain could have seen coming a million miles away and Violet is thoroughly embarrassed by her dad's incompetence and just wants this nightmare to be over with as fast as possible, which is how I felt watching this movie. I 
will say, though, that for as much as I hate this scene because of how much it drives Bob's character through the mud again, I like how Dax is portrayed in this scene. He is fully aware of how dumb of a plan this is and just kind of sits back in the corner of the booth, happily sipping his water and watching the chaos unfold, even kind of playing along by introducing himself to Tony. It's a nice touch. I will award points for that. And now, back to Anchorman Chad with the weather. Today's forecast? EDC with a chance of contrivance. Elastigirl puts her plan into action as she starts a remote interview, but it doesn't take long for the broadcast to be hijacked as the screen slaver delivers his villain monologue on live TV, thus falling right into her trap and allowing her to track the signal thanks to Evelyn's invention, of all people, and thus she gets on the move. You know, I feel like this plan might have had a bit of a weak spot considering that Elastigirl has to look at a screen in order to track the screen slaver's signal, which is something you'd think Helen would have accounted for when coming up with this plan. Now, of course, we know by the end of the movie why they don't hijack this screen, but Helen had no reason to assume that she'd be safe from that here. Next, we get another scene where the movie tries to communicate a message, but you know what? This time, it's handled surprisingly well. The screen sliver goes on an intricately thought out rant about how he's fed up with people being so obsessed with screens that they miss out on the joys that real world experiences can offer them. You don't talk, you watch talk shows. You don't play games, you watch game shows. Every meaningful experience must be packaged and delivered to you to watch at a distance. And this is a really, really interesting idea for a villain, because there is some truth to the matter in regards to how technology has dominated so much of our day to day lives. And no, I'm not trying to say, oh yeah, you young whippersnappers, kids these days with their goddamn technology, <laughs> But I do still think there is validity to the idea that for an alarming amount of people, their life experience is often restricted solely to what is available through television. And there's even something to be said about how that can taint your view of the real world when all you know about it is what you're told secondhand. Of course, it's hilarious to watch a movie distributed by Disney say something like this. Ever ravenous consumers who can't bring themselves to rise from their couches. Considering the mindset that so many seem to have have when consuming Disney products and when they just keep pumping out new forms of garbage every month to make sure you always get your fill of products to consume, but ignoring the meta context, this is a really interesting idea to put forth. But wait, I hear you crying out. You've criticized previous thematic moments in this movie because while they present interesting ideas, they fall flat on execution because they have no relevance to the events of the story, while the difference is that it's actually executed really, really well here. In fact, I might even go as far as to say it's the most effective thematic messaging in the movie, because the way in which it is framed only goes to perfectly prove the point the screen slaver is trying to make. As he's delivering his monologue, you watch Elastigirl elegantly bounce, swing, and soar her way through the city with dazzling animation and cinematography. You just want to tune out all the background noise and focus solely on the packaged entertainment crafted specifically to mesmerize you, which is the very thing the screen slaver is trying to warn you about. You're so caught up in the action that you almost entirely tune out his words and miss it in favor of what's being shown to you on the screen. It actually genuinely impressed me when I saw this in theaters for the first time and walked away realizing how effectively that scene was getting its message across. And that from other people I've spoken to, it seems to have had that effect pretty universally. And that is the distinction between a scene like this and something like the inventive versus seller conversation from earlier. One is only interesting in isolation with nothing substantive to support it, and one ties in naturally with the story and uses every element of the scene to help support its message and the overarching motivations of the villain. Or at least... I would say all that if the screen slaver's motivations had literally anything to do with the villain's actual motivations, but I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself again. Oh, by the way, Elastigirl finally locates the source of the signal, which turns out to be an apartment with all the windows boarded up, a colical amount of antennas and cables sticking out of the building, and an ominous green hue emanating from inside. This couldn't scream evil lair any harder if it tried, and you're telling me that nobody has ever found this place even slightly suspicious before this point? Alrighty then. She breaks into the screen slaver's lair and starts investigating the room, examining such subtle clues as hypnotism posters, Vecna clocks, as well as hover train plans and pictures of the ambassador, and before we go any further, I'm going to have to take a second to pause the video and very clearly reiterate my warning from earlier that you are about to witness a series of flashing lights. Now yes, there was one that happened earlier during the interview, and hopefully the text countdown was an adequate enough warning for that. But this is THE scene that kickstarted the controversy surrounding Incredibles 2 when it released. If you are at all susceptible to photosensitive of epilepsy, I implore you to skip to this timestamp to bypass this scene entirely. And in case you're wondering why I am making such a big deal about this in my video, is because Pixar didn't make a deal about it at all when the film was first released in theaters. If you jump back to the internet in June of 2018, you will find reports of people suffering from epileptic seizures, some of whom have to be physically carried out of the theater, or you'll find numerous people campaigning for Disney to do the absolute bare minimum of putting a trigger warning at the very least before the movie begins. But 
preferably publicly announced in advance so that your money isn't wasted on a ticket to a movie that you can't see. But yeah, for some baffling reason, not a single person at Disney or Pixar thought it might be a good idea to put a potential seizure warning on there. And I can tell you from experience that seizures are, uh, not fun, to say the least. They're actually kind of terrifying to experience. Disney absolutely should have put out a warning of some kind when this movie came out, and I have absolutely no idea how this made it through any amount of screen testing without somebody saying, How about we don't? This isn't just some disorienting imagery or frames that flash by extremely quickly. This is a whole new level of seizure inducing. Just look at this. <laughs> I am not affected by epilepsy. The seizure I alluded to earlier was febrile and happened when I was in middle school. But I was still completely caught off guard by this sequence and I came out of it with a splitting headache and my eyes spent an inordinate amount of time trying to readjust when it finally mercifully ended. This is egregious to say the absolute least and it makes it borderline impossible to actually be able to see what the hell is going on. The idea, I think, is that Screenslaver activates the seizure walls to make it harder for her to be able to fight back. But from a meta viewing perspective, it's almost on watchable because what's hard for her to see is just as hard for the audience to see. I'd love to give you a frame-by-frame -frame breakdown of the choreography to either praise or criticize it, but to be perfectly honest with you, my eyes just can't be asked to suffer through this. Whoa, come on, dude. You're being, like, way too unfair to Pixar right now, bro. They eventually did put a seizure warning before the movie. Yeah like half a month later. It took half a month for an official trigger warning to be implemented and another full month after that point for them to release an edited version of the film that passed the Harding Box test. Prior to that point, from the day the film first came out mid-June to the beginning of July, they left it up to individual theaters to put up warning signs about the movie. And you might say, see? So they did react to it as quickly as they could. Yeah, they reacted to it. And therein lies the problem. This never should have been something they needed to react to in the first place. This should have been caught and stopped as soon as it was conceived of. This scene made it through multiple different stages of production from storyboards all the way to the finished product over months or possibly years, and at no point did anyone call attention to how horrifically irresponsible this was. Or if they did, they were promptly ignored by higher-ups. Pixar retroactively telling theaters to warn people doesn't do anything about the ones who've already suffered from seizures thanks to this movie. Pixar should have thought to put a seizure warning out, and the fact that they didn't, not even a single person thought of this just legitimately blows my mind. And the scene doesn't even add anything anyway. If you wanted to have a fight scene that gives him the upper hand, just make the room pitch black and force her to fight the screenslaver in the dark when he can still see her with the night vision goggles. Or, maybe you could have him use the socks flashlights built into his goggles that we see him use moments later. You could have accomplished your intended effect in much simpler and less epileptic ways than what you actually went with. But whatever, now that it's over and my headache is starting to clear up, the screen Slaver activates an emergency bomb to destroy all the evidence and then runs for his life once he realizes that he can't defeat a lousy girl in combat. But she's not wanting to give up as she gives pursuit down the halls of the apartment building as fast as she can, which is really, really dumb because you can stretch your arms. What does your theme song say about you again? Well, apparently the screen slaver is actually beyond your reach because you don't even try to use your elasticity to reach out and grab him at all except for this one instance when he's running down the stairs. Actually, you don't even necessarily need to grab him. Just fling yourself through the hallway to catch up to him quicker. We see you do that later in this chase scene. Why wasn't this the first thing you tried to do? The idea that this dude is somehow able to outrun Elastigirl for even a second is actually hilarious to think about. This chase should have been over as soon as it began, but because she forgets to use her powers at all the most inconvenient moments and runs toward him instead of just grabbing him, it takes them all the way until they jump outside the building. Brilliant. So the building explodes behind them and everybody inside dies. Or at least that's what definitely should have happened considering the size of this explosion. But apparently nobody cares about all the innocent civilians who just got incinerated. But of course, we can't actually acknowledge the insane amounts of collateral damage Elastigirl has inadvertently caused, because doing that would spit in the face of the pie charts from earlier. And we can't be having that, of course, otherwise it would screw up the whole movie. It's not like someone like her who should absolutely value the lives of innocent people should have at least tried to save the people inside the apartment building or stop the bomb's detonation instead of prioritizing the screen slaver, who can easily be apprehended given that the only means of escape he has is to run away, whereas it would only take a minute or two for a cop call to roll up on the scene. But nope! Apparently, Elastigirl doesn't give these innocent civilians as much as a passing glance, which is not only a massive blow to the integrity of her character's moral principles, it also makes the decision to send her on this mission because she causes the least amount of collateral damage much harder to take seriously when stuff like this is happening as frequently 
gnarly as it is. Hey, you want to see a fun little scene for The Incredibles? You can't run out of ice. I thought you could use the water in the air. There is no water in this air. What's your excuse? Run out of muscle? I can't just go smash it through walls. The building's getting weaker by the second. It's going to come down on top of it. I wanted to go bowling. Mr. Incredible and Frozone have a heated conversation about what to do to try to safely get these people out of here before it's too late. They try to extinguish the flames, but Frozone is dehydrated and there's no water in the air that he can pull from. Mr. Incredible can reliably burst open an escape route because that building is so structurally unsound that the slightest disturbance could cause it to come crumbling down on top of them. Minimizing collateral damage is of maximum importance to them, and they take extreme care to make sure they don't do anything rash if it would run the risk of endangering the people they're trying to protect. Meanwhile, in this movie, Elastigirl flees past dozens of people completely unaware of what's going on when she knows full well that they are minutes away from exploding in a fiery inferno, and there's no way they could all get out in time on their own. If you didn't already hate how she's characterized in this movie, then this should be the thing to push you over the edge on that topic, because her complete lack of concern for all these people is downright horrific. Next up, we get the big reveal that the screen slaver is some dweeb who delivers pizzas for a living. How thrilling. But of course, this obviously isn't actually the real screen slaver, because it's immediately apparent from his reaction upon the mask being pulled off that he was being mind controlled. What happened? That is literally the exact same reaction that the local pilot had after the hover train chase. You didn't try to get him arrested because you very quickly understood that he was under the screenslaver's control and had no memory of what actually happened. Yet in this scene, her immediate response upon hearing the pizza guy say this is, What happened is you destroyed my evidence. Which is just... God damn it, movie. She's not this stupid. Helen, you are way, way smarter and more perceptive than this film is making you out to be. Do you guys remember Helen Parr from the original Incredibles? How she demonstrated a remarkable sense of leadership under an enormous amount of pressure, able to remain calm and collected and come up with creative and clever plans to get the job done, finding a way to get her family safely to dry land after crashing in the ocean, being able to immediately and successfully identify the type and origin of the missiles that attacked their jet, or hell, even just being able to figure out that something was going on because she noticed a small tear on Bob's suit in the tiniest of hairs, or the smallest piece of rubble in existence. That's part of what made you so likable. Outside of your no-nonsense attitude and unyielding desire to keep your family safe, you were demonstrated as being someone who was incredibly competent at action and able to pick up on the smallest of details. Yet all of a sudden in the sequel, you're so bafflingly dense that you don't think there's anything even remotely suspicious about the way this guy reacts to having his mask pulled off. You know about the mind control. You're aware of how the screenslaver operates. You should know that something is amiss here. But no, you've actually just come to the conclusion without hesitation that he's a screen slaver and are happily watching him get arrested after he's pleading that he doesn't understand what's going on. What's going on? What'd I do? What'd you guys do to me? That's right, punk. Blame the system. You what? You have to jump through some pretty crazy hoops in order to link together those two lines in a reasonable way. I assume this is supposed to distract the audience from the stupidity of the story. You know, another one of those, let's drop a message with limitless potential for gripping storytelling and commentary on the justice system into our movie without elaborating on it in any way. But it doesn't work because Helen would have never fallen for this obvious decision. And she clearly didn't fall for it earlier with the local pilot because she could clearly see that he was being controlled by the screen. It shut off directly in front of her. What changed? What is the difference between these two events? The fact that he was wearing the screen slaver's mask? Yeah, I'm sure that's some really ironclad proof when you just got done examining an evil lair with eyeballs on display to try to help him figure out how best to hypnotize people, followed by the very last thing you discovered before all hell broke loose being a pair of goggles. Gee, I wonder if there might be a connection between these two things. Things. Your tracker worked like a charm, Evelyn. You're a genius. Aw, oh, shucks. I'm just the genius behind the genius. Oh my god, just shoot me now. Dialogue is dead. There's no longer any room for subtlety and nuance when it comes to these things. Let's just have the character whose name is Evil Endeavor literally say that she's the genius behind the genius, seconds after discovering that whoever Helen caught clearly was not the actual screen slaver. In case there's anybody out there who still doesn't understand that she's the twist villain yet. Alright, back with Bob now, who apparently is very tired and ready to commit die. One scene ago, he was as confident and arrogant as could be, yet now he's done a complete heel turn without any bull up whatsoever, look dead inside. And outside, for that matter. Dash walks up to him and begs him to help figure out the next math topic, but before he gets a chance to help, he sees in the news that his classic car, the Incredibile, was just sold at an auction. But wait, this cannot be, because apparently... They said it was destroyed. Which... What? How and when was your car destroyed? Under what circumstances did that happen? It wasn't destroyed in the last movie, it was perfectly intact. Where did it go? What happened? How did you end up losing your car, but not the remote that controls the car? Wait, the Incredible is also a remote control car? Yet since when was that a thing? Does this thing still have batteries in it after 15 years of not being used? I feel like this has been more than corroded by this point. And if it hasn't, that's probably because it never had any batteries in it in the first place. And if it miraculously still functions properly, is it really able to control the car from this far away with seemingly zero latency? 
Really? Dash yoinks the remote out of Bob's hands to do what he does best, which is to push more buttons. Great. Except this time, instead of dropping furniture into the water, he almost blows up a room full of people with the car's built-in rocket launchers that it apparently had this whole time. What are you doing? This is not a toy. Hmm? Two seconds ago, you were recklessly driving this car around the room with a smile of a madman on your face, and you're gonna chew out Dash for playing with a car like it's a toy? Okay, buddy. Having said that, Dash, what the hell is wrong with you? Do I need to play the scene from Toy Story again? Rockets explode! Do you not care at all about murdering everybody in that room with the rocket launcher? You are definitely old enough to understand how dangerous those things are. One movie ago, you were in a jet that was blown up by missiles, and as soon as you caught sight of them, your immediate reaction was one of genuine fear because you understood what they were capable of. This Dash would be the person to send the missiles to kill this Dash. What happened to you? Dash wasn't just a heartless jerk for no reason in the first movie. He had a desire to show the world what he could do because he was a little kid born with extraordinary gifts but wasn't allowed to show them off. He had a tidal wave of energy building up inside him and had to find ways to let it out whatever he could, hence why he acted out the way that he did in that movie. But at his core, he still cared about his family and had a desire to do the right thing when the chips were down. And by the end, he was given the chance he always wanted to be able to go out for sports, but learned to restrain himself enough so as not to show his hand about his superpowers. He found a compromise with his family. He finally has a safe place where he can let out his energy but not go too overboard at the same time. It's part of the family learning to trust each other, but specifically for Dash, it's the culmination of his growth throughout the movie. He obviously wasn't the core focus of the story, but he still got meaningful development and was given proper setups and payoffs. Now, this isn't to say that I thought he was never going to act out again. He's a little kid. Siblings bickering and giving people out attitude is just par for the course. But that doesn't mean he should be sitting here actively calling for the death and destruction of these people given everything he went through in the last movie. It's an absolute joke of a scene, only I'm not laughing, Bob. Not laughing. I'm pissed at seeing all these characters get torn to pieces one by one. Speaking of which, after Bob gives up on torturing people with his car, Jack-Jack sneezes and rockets himself into Violet's room, causing her to run downstairs in fear of the demon baby. Surprise! Jack-Jack has superpowers! But rather than reacting like normal kids would and going, WHOA! Oh, that's so cool! They instead proceed to morph into obnoxious brats who keep asking Bob why he hasn't told them or Helen yet, and doing a Bo Peep from Toy Story 4 where they ask the same questions over and over again before he ever gets the chance to actually answer them. You've both become so uncharacteristically insufferable, which sucks because your development was some of the best parts of the first movie. And as far as Bob's concerned, there is a very obvious rebuttal to their question. All he has to do is say, she's busy with her job and has enough on her mind right now. She doesn't need the additional stress of worrying about her infant baby having superpowers. That's something you clearly genuinely believe since the whole reason you gave up with the RC stunt was because... Hey, do you think I want an angry rich guy coming after me right now when I'm trying not to distract you? So you'd assume, obviously, that he would just say that to his kids. But no! Instead, he goes on a hilarious ramble about how he's formulating plans and... Rolling with the punches, baby! It's just, I, I don't... Comedy goal. Laugh at the crazy man losing his mind. Jokes are hard to write, okay? I just do not buy the idea that Bob would have gone this completely insane and be this visibly dejected given the events of the film up until this point, and especially not on the abbreviated time frame this is all happening in. And the way that the kids respond to this little ramble doesn't help matters at all. After Jack-Jack takes off like a rock it again. Bob charges through the glass door to get ready to catch him after which Violet says, I'm calling Lucius. You're doing what? It's a super baby with powers nobody understands yet and nobody can control. What exactly is Lucius gonna do that you haven't already tried? Especially when he doesn't have any kids himself? Please walk me through this incredible logic. Explain to me the magic cure-all you think Lucius is gonna pull out of his ass when he comes over. Well, the answer is nothing. Lucius doesn't do anything once he gets to the house except make a ball of ice for Jack-Jack to chew on. He's just as taken back by his wacky superpowers as the rest of the family was. The only purpose bringing him here serves is to give the audience a taste of a fan-favorite character saying funny things, including the classic, almost throwing Samuel L. Jackson line. What the bike? Which is admittedly a nice touch that I appreciate. But of course, the other reason why he's here is to direct Bob to seek Jack-Jack advice from another fan-favorite character, Edna Mode. But honestly, I actually think Edna is handled rather respectfully in this movie. Far too often you'll see an instance of a writer introducing a character that unexpectedly becomes a fan-favorite, and then having that writer proceed to bend over backwards for the sequel and double down on shoving that character anywhere and everywhere, even if they don't at all feel natural in the story. But they clearly demonstrated an admirable amount of restraint here, because it's no secret that 
that despite her very limited presence in the first movie, Edna put forth some of its most memorable quotes, including, but not limited to, I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. And, of course, No kicks! I highly doubt they intended for her to become as big of a fan favorite as they did, and I was really worried that they were gonna pull an Aladdin and the King of Thieves and drastically overblow her role in the story, but thankfully, that did not happen. The idea here is that since Bob has had no luck in gaining an understanding of Jack-Jack's constantly expanding list of abilities, which, by the way, is only added to here as he gains the ability to mimic people's appearances, as well as in the Auntie Edna short where we learn he can turn into a Cloud Baby, Water Baby, and Firecracker Baby, he's going to leave him with someone who specializes in studying superheroes' abilities and designing suits in order to account for them to help him figure out how to get a hold of his powers. It's a really, really solid in-universe justification for why Edna would have a reason to be relevant to the story again, and give some really cute and funny interactions to watch between her and Jack-Jack. Unfortunately, all those scenes were cut from the movie and repackaged in the form of a short you can only watch in the Blu-ray or on Disney+. Plus. <clears throat> but they're still entertaining to watch nonetheless, even if they absolutely should have been in the film. So Edna, despite being initially reluctant to accept his offer, changes her tune quite quickly once she realizes just how powerful Jack-Jack really is, and takes on the challenge in a heartbeat while sending Bob home to get some sleep. He slumps down on the couch next to Violet and apologizes for being an idiot all movie, and then there's a brief moment of reconciliation before he falls asleep. Meanwhile, Winston is throwing a party, celebrating the impending legalization of superheroes as well as the downfall of the screen slaver. His reign was short, huh? Yeah, it was. Almost as if the reign was too short and there might still be something else going on you should look into. Be a shame if Helen was too stupid to see through the smoke screen. He then proceeds to announce that, in his own words, Just now. At a worldwide summit, leaders from more than a hundred of the world's top countries have agreed to make superheroes legal again! <laughs> Excuse me, what? They agreed to do what now? How long has it been since the start of this movie? It can be a bit hard to tell sometimes because of how lightning fast everything moves all the time, but it has absolutely been less than a week since the Underminer attack. And you mean to tell me not only that world leaders agreed to reverse their decision about superheroes in that unbelievably short amount of time, but also that the bureaucratic procedures required to actually do that have apparently moved so fast to have been able to even reverse it at all in less than a week? Another bad joke. Making this all happen so fast is severely affecting the integrity of the world building if the world leader's decisions can be so easily reversed without even a second thought mere days after they doubled down their decision and went so far with it as to shut down the superhero relocation program. But then, I suppose there's a more pressing concern about this scene that we should probably talk about. Void reminds the audience that she exists and then Helen wanders into the editing room where she curiously looks over the footage from her suit cam because she suspects that something is amiss with a screen slaver saying that it was too easy oh for god's sake really now you have concerns about the fact that the screen slaver might still be out there and not right then and there when it could not have been more blatantly obvious that this dweeb wasn't actually him you've got to be kidding me they just keep dialing up and down the intelligence of the characters whenever they need them to be stupid or smart in order for the plot to keep happening anyway as helen is examining the footage evelyn wanders into the room what a fascinating coincidence and we get yet another brief chat between the two of them about a fascinating topic this time it's the idea of people people who are willing to trade quality for ease in a heartbeat, and how that can factor into the design of certain products. Which, uh, by the way, is a very hilarious thing to say coming out of the company partially founded by the person responsible for Apple products, but you get it just by now. Neat idea, sloppy execution, and an even sloppier transition to the next big plot beat, which is about how capturing the screen slaver was far too easy. And that feeling of unease is what allows her to see that one of the monitors inside the evil lair was tuned into Elastigirl's suit cam, which was supposed to be a closed circuit. Are you kidding me? Are you actually kidding me. This mistake is gonna be the thing to do you in. Why in the world would you ever need to have Elastigirl's suit cam footage on display in that room? Literally, what purpose could that possibly serve? Everything he did happened because of an order he was given. He doesn't need to be able to see what's going on here. And even if he does, you couldn't just turn off the monitor before you went to attack her? Elastigirl finally realizes that the guy she put in jail was just a passy set up by the real screen slaver and controlled by the goggles he was wearing. Unfortunately, because she was written to be an idiot up until this point, she is too too late as Evelyn slams the goggles onto her face and screen slaves her mind. Gee, if only it didn't take you six years longer than it should have for you to make this deduction. Maybe you could have avoided this unfortunate turn of events. Also, is that really all that it takes for these things to activate? Just pressing them against someone's skin? I guess the goggles are just contact sensitive and Evelyn doesn't need to push any buttons or anything to activate them. And boy howdy, how insanely convenient is it that Winston just decided to let her have the screen slaver mask as a memento? Otherwise, Alaska wouldn't have been able to confirm her suspicions and Evelyn wouldn't have had any to subdue her with. You'd think that Winston wouldn't have even been allowed to
to keep this at all, and it would have just gone straight into evidence, but whatever. And with that, the big twist villain is revealed. The character literally called Evil Endeavor, who's in the shadows of every scene and who has such subtle lines as... I'm just the genius behind the genius. Phenomenal writing, truly. But sadly, this is going to be where we stop for the day. I know, it's such a tease to cut things off right before we get to one of the most important and simultaneously most broken scenes in the movie. But all good things must come to an end at some point, and I gotta cut it off now before things fly off the rails. Because once we cross a certain threshold in the story, we're gonna be charging full steam ahead with rampant idiocy almost non-stop. The final part of this trilogy is gonna be a doozy. Because not only are we going to finally extensively break down Evelyn's moronic plan now that the screen slaver's identity has been revealed, and not only are we going to be dealing with the final nails in the coffin for the assassination of such beloved characters, but we are also going to run through one of the most absurdly inept and infuriating climaxes imaginable, to the point where it genuinely gives Toy Story 4's climax a run for its money, which is aided in no small part by Void's reality-destroying portal mechanics. All of that and more will be coming soon to a YouTube video near you, but this time around, I don't want to make any more concrete promises for release dates. I massively underestimated how much time it was going to take to get Part 2 out when I committed to a day last time. The best that I can say is that the video will be out before the end of September, which sounds vague and lame, I know, but perhaps I can soften that blow somewhat by letting you know that it will be just about two hours long. We've really got a lot of ground to cover for the finale, and I'd rather take my time to make it the best that it can be and surprise you all with the release rather than make a promise that I just can't keep in the end. But one promise that I can make is that I will be working as fast as is humanly and healthily possible to get the final part out for you all to see because I am so far beyond excited to steamroll through the insanity that is Incredibles 2's third act. Thanks for watching, everybody, and hope to see you all soon for the exciting conclusion to how Incredibles 2 destroyed everything. Goodbye.